What? I wish I had a light up here, but there's no light, is it? I'll see if you ever read. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Good afternoon and welcome to our inaugural luncheon. I want to thank the sponsors for today's lunch, Uber Technologies Inc. and Philips Lighting. First, I'd like to introduce Javier Carrioso the Public Affairs Manager for Uber in Florida. In this role, he heads up Uber's communications and branding throughout the state. Prior to joining Uber, Javier was an advisor to Marco Rubio's presidential campaign and has served as Chief of Staff in the United States Congress. Please welcome Javier Carrioso. Thank you. My name is Javier Corioso. I am a part of Uber's public affairs team based here out of Miami. I hope you have all enjoyed everything our city has had to offer this weekend. I know you may not admit it this morning, but uh, I saw some of you breaking it down with Casey and the Sunshine Band last night. So uh, I hope you enjoyed our beaches and everything our, our region has to offer. I also want to take this opportunity uh, to thank uh, Mayor Cornett, Mayor Levine, the entire team at the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the great staff here at the Fountain Blue Hotel for putting together a great annual meeting uh, this, this past weekend. And uh, Mayor Landrieu, we wish you all the best as you take over this conference at a very critical time in our nation's history. At Uber, we're focused on developing new technologies, expanding ride sharing, and working side by side with government leaders to help strengthen our current and future transportation systems. One of the way, ways in which we are strengthening cities is by expanding ride sharing options such as Uber Pool, which helps get more people in fewer cars, meaning cheaper rides for passengers and less congestion and pollution in cities over time. At Uber, we had a breakthrough a few years ago when our engineers uh, noticed that many riders uh, were taking the same route at the same time. So we asked ourselves, could we use mobile technology to conveniently match these people up in real time? Could we turn these two, three, and four trips into one trip? And the answer was a resounding yes. Here in South Florida, we launched Uber Pool in fall of 2015. And I got to tell you, South Florida is a place where for generations, everyone has used their own vehicles to get everywhere, whether it's to get to work, to go out at night, 
even to get to the beach on the weekends. We use our own cars for everything. So we launched this product nearly two years ago, and what have the results been? Well, for one, the residents of South Florida are changing their views on car ownership. Price and convenience is what matters to them the most. For example, every morning for my commute into downtown Miami, I take an Uber pool ride from my house to the South Miami Metro Rail Station uh, in the southern part of Miami-Dade County. And along the way, we pick up other riders that are also headed to their transit station. We are complementing our public transit. Nearly 30% of Uber trips here in South Florida are now shared trips. Thanks to the leadership of local leaders who have embraced innovation, like Mayor Jimenez, like Mayor Levine, we are not only changing the transportation DNA of South Floridians, but we are also making a positive environmental impact. Since the launch of Uber Pool, there have been nearly 15 million miles saved by riders taking a shared trip in this region. That means that 300,000 gallons of gasoline have been saved and over 2.5 million kilograms of CO2 emissions have also been saved by riders. Today, ride sharing accounts for just 4% of the miles driven globally. Morgan Stanley in a recent study estimates that that number will rise to more than 25% by the year 2030. Mayors, just imagine the possibilities that lie ahead. Finally, another way in which we want to work with government leaders to help strengthen our current and future transportation systems is through a new product we have called Uber Movement. Uber Movement uses Uber's data to help cities make data-driven transportation policy, planning, and operational decisions. We want to make cities move more efficiently, so that's why we're providing free access, and we want to work with you all to give you free access to data from over two billion trips to help improve urban planning in your cities. While we continue to develop and expand Uber's technology, we have found time and time again that when Uber partners with government together, we help move people more efficiently, more effectively, and with more equity. Look, I know that we've had some high stakes, very public battles throughout the years, but we're here today to tell you that we want to work together. We want to work together to take cars off the road. We want to work together to make your decision making process better. Some of the resources that you may be using to build parking garages can be better used to build affordable housing, to build green space, to make cities better for your constituents. As we continue to think about the future of mobility, let's keep finding new ways to work together. New ways to utilize our technology with public services and third party groups and continue to help more people move better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier. For years, United States Conference of Mayors and Phillips Lighting have worked to assist cities in meeting their energy efficiency goals. Uh, we all heard uh, Mayor Callan Goodman at our business council breakfast talk openly about what Phillips has done in helping us change all the lights in Las Vegas. That's a hell of a lot of lights, as you know, in uh, Las Vegas. And so this afternoon, it is my pleasure to introduce Jeffrey Cassis, the Senior Vice President and Head of Government Business in Phillips Lighting. Jeff is responsible for driving Phillips market strategy and planning for connected lighting systems and services. He's, his specific focus is on smart cities and more than 25 years of experience in the manufacturing semiconductor and the electronics industries. Please welcome Jeff Cassis. Well, thank you very much for the introductions. On behalf of the entire Phillips Lighting team, I'm, I'm honored and delighted to be here today to honor uh, Mitch Landry, the mayor, for we will assume his new roles and responsibilities, president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, quite an honor. Phillips has actively participated with the Conference of Mayors since 2010, a little over six years now. And I can tell you from my experience, my first time here, that this has been a remarkable experience to see the, the sharing and the collaboration. 
I think that I see firsthand the roles as city leaders are evolving and what you are required to do is constantly changing. This is especially true now than ever before. As we heard this week, and I, and I stress also when I look at cities, they're really a microcosm for pervasive issues that affect everyone, regardless of the zip code where they call home. From constrained budgets that all of you have, I've heard that quite a bit this week, and also growing populations to aging infrastructures and the acceleration pace of innovation, which is absolutely going to change the way we work and live in the future. While there's a growing urgency, I believe, to address these issues, there's also a greater opportunity to find workable solutions and collectively more move towards a shared purpose. Truly a shared purpose, I think, is something both industry and the public have in common with government. Increasing collaboration between public and private sectors can have a greater change and overcome greater challenges when our resources, our creativity are pooled. If we continue to make progress, even incrementally, the potential impact grows exponentially. We know this is true because we see the improvement every day that you're making in the lives of your constituents. Mayor's leadership and resi resilience and the display that I, I've seen in the initiatives that you've taken to tackle the world's toughest challenges, the Climate Initiatives One, which directly threatens the livelihood and prosperity of your cities. By continuing to stay the course, your cities serve as a bellwether for future progress. I'm very confident that we'll see that in the years ahead. I'm hard pressed to think of a better example of the city's resolve than New Orleans. In 2015, 10 years following one of the most devastating natural disasters in our history, New Orleans has returned to the list of the 50 most populous states in the union. It's a remarkable accomplishment of that leadership. So Mayor Landu, on behalf of all of us at Phillips Lighting, we wish you more decades of success and um, your new role as president. Thank you. And, oh, by the way, I'm a lighting guy, so uh, all of you mayors uh, get to take home a 60 watt equivalent LED bulb. This was actually uh, something that we, we actually invented about six years ago. So this is for you to remind you when you get home for energy efficiency you can start at home. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Jeff. Let's give it a hand for Jeff. We really appreciate Uber and Phillips. Okay. Let me now call up somebody you have not heard from during this whole meeting who's done a great job, the best of all, I think. Our host mayor, the mayor of Miami Beach, Mayor Philip Levine. He's going to give us some comments about the next speaker. Mayor Levine. Man, Tom, I was just about to bite into my chicken. Thank God I didn't in my low-carb diet. First of all, I'm so honored to everybody be here. And, and uh, Mr. President, Mayor Landrieu, congratulations. And I see we have James Carville. I've actually never been on a dais before with two Cajuns. So this is my, this is my first time. No, I was a raging Cajun. Good afternoon, mayors. First of all, I want to thank my friend, Mayor Manny Diaz, for all the amazing work he has done to help bring this conference to Miami Beach. Without your determined efforts, we couldn't have done this without you. As a former mayor of Miami and also as a former president of the United States Conference of Mayors, the advice you have given me over the past years has been invaluable. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. During the eight years that Manny was the mayor of Miami, he took a city government that was bankrupt, not only brought it back to life, but left it thriving. His tenure was characterized by rapid growth in the city's urban development and was uniformly praised for his business style leadership and private sector oriented approach to governing the city. I'm also glad he is here today to introduce another mayor who I have also looked up to as a role model former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg. <laughs> 
What he did with the city is a template for what we have tried to achieve here in Miami Beach during my time in office. Like Bloomberg's New York, our city is in the midst of a cultural and economic renaissance. In fact, I took it as a real badge of honor when a few magazines referred to me as the Bloomberg of the South. Although, to be honest, uh, my net worth is a few zeros away from the mayor's. Mayor Bloomberg ran a platform of returning New York City back into the hands of its residents. He leveraged his extensive experience in the private sector and skillfully applied those lessons to government. Whether by presiding over one of the largest reductions in the city's crime rate, spurring major infrastructure projects like the High Line, or through his numerous public health initiatives, Mayor Bloomberg made New York City a better place to live. I am proud to share the stage with two of our nation's greatest former mayors. And I am proud to have my friend Manny Diaz welcome a mayor who I consider to be a role model to many, including myself. Mi amigo Manny, tu siempre serás nuestro alcalde. Thank you. Thank you. And now let me, let me say some things about our next person that's going to introduce, introduce the other person. His name is Manny Diaz. He came here with his mother from Cuba. He had a seated job making less than a dollar and a half an hour. When you get up in the morning, when you go to the elevator, look out, look out across that sky and see Miami. Look at that skyline. That's the house that Manny built. Think about Miami before Manny Diaz. He was our president on the verge of Barack Obama becoming our president. And we welcome the president here in 2007, where Mayor Barack Obama gave an electrifying speech to the mayors of this nation. We left here. We had five forums. We had an urban program. We, we will never know what President Obama could have done for this nation if he, we had not had the meltdown. And, the, and, the, and the, the policy that we developed with Manny Diaz is still there. And really, uh, Mayor Landry was a base for your agenda this year. So let's all welcome the great mayor of Miami and the former president of this organization, Manny Diaz. Thank you, Tom. Um, it's still great to be introduced by you after all these years and to see you and your staff continue to do the excellent work that the Conference of Mayors has been known for for so many years. So good afternoon to all of you. Uh, buenas tardes. Mayor Levine, you and your team have done an outstanding job putting this conference together. Really outstanding. And uh, Governor Cornette, I mean, Mayor Cornette. Uh, <laughs> congratulations on all your le years of leadership with the conference, and in particular this past year as, as our president. W welcome to the uh, former President's Club, or the has-beens, I don't know which, but uh, welcome. We're proud to have you, and Mayor Landrieu, and Benjamin, and Barnett. The conference is in very, very good hands going forward. So it is my pleasure today to introduce my friend, Mike Bloomberg. We were both elected just two months after 9-11. I was blessed to work with Mike during my eight years as mayor and as president of this organization. I am particularly honored that he asked me to serve on the board of Bloomberg Philanthropies, where during the past seven years, I have witnessed his commitment to saving millions of lives sparing millions from pain and suffering, and creating a safer, healthier, and happier world. He has been a mentor, a friend, and an inspiration to me and to mayors across America and across the world. Now, he may not admit it, but I think he may still be a little sore at me 
for the Miami Marlins' stunning victory against the mighty New York Yankees in the 2003 World Series. Uh, he never forgets. He's got a good memory. My, <laughs> Mike Bloomberg is a mayor's mayor. Whether it is improving the health of our citizens, tackling the problem of crime and illegal guns, and raising the level of achievement for our young people through educational opportunities, Mike takes on the causes that all of us believe in, and he leads the way. There are two specific areas that I want to mention today. In the face of a global environmental crisis ignored by Washington, Mike Bloomberg leads the way. He created New York's first comprehensive sustainability plan that helped reduce their carbon footprint by almost 20 percent. And through his leadership of the C40, and now as the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for Cities and Climate Change, Mike continues to work with mayors to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve their city's resiliency. Bloomberg Philanthropies formed a partnership with the, with the European Union to create the Global Covenant of Mayors of, for Climate and Energy, uniting more than 7,400 cities from 121 countries in efforts to reduce carbon emissions and adapt to climate change. Since 2010, Beyond Coal, a Bloomberg Philanthropies-backed campaign led by the Sierra Club, has helped close that more than 250 out of 523 coal-fired power plants in the United States. This represents a reduction in carbon dioxide emissions, equivalent to taking more than 100 million cars off of all of your roads in your cities. That's true leadership. And while Washington continues to fail to adopt comprehensive immigration reform, this is how Mike Bloomberg responds. And I quote, the diversity they represent is what makes our city special. This is New York City. They believe in the promise it has always offered. And that's one of the messages I have been speaking out on. To those who are wailing against immigration, to those politicians who all of a sudden have embraced xenophobia, I say, open your eyes. Take a look behind me. This is what makes America great. This is New York City. This is freedom. This is compassion, democracy, and opportunity. Mike Bloomberg believes in the promise of an America that continues to serve as a beacon of hope and opportunity for all Americans and especially for new Americans. That's true leadership. And finally, Mike believes in the transformative power of cities and the influence a mayor can have for positive change. Forget Washington. Mike knows that the real solutions come from cities, and that is why he continues to invest in all of us. He knows that mayors don't have the luxury of spending their days holding ideological debates. He knows that mayors are elected to solve the problems that affect people's everyday lives, that mayors put aside partisan differences to find common ground, and that mayors put progress before partisanship. He understands that the most complex global challenges are best addressed with local solutions. That is why Mike and Bloomberg Philanthropies have invested in the Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative, the Mayor's Challenge, the City Innovation Teams, the What Works City Initiative, City Lab, Bloomberg Associates, and the Public Arts Challenge. These investments will equip mayors with the tools, skills, and support required to tackle the complex challenges faced in governing cities, while encouraging bold new ideas 
that have the potential to solve our urban problems. Mike and Bloomberg Philanthropies have now invested in more than 420 cities in more than 120 countries. And today, Mike will announce a strengthening of our partnership with America's mayors and America's cities. You know, there's a former mayor of New York City who fancies himself as America's mayor. Well, mayors, it gives me great pleasure to introduce another former mayor of New York City, one that has rightfully earned the title of the world's mayor, Mike Bloomberg. Thank you, thank you. Please sit and please keep eating. Uh, the food is, looks good. I'm on a diet, so I didn't, uh, but, but Mitch doesn't need it. He's going to eat everything on his plate. Anyways, Manny, thank you uh, for all of that. Uh, it was totally unnecessary, but I loved every minute of it. And when you said we did the equivalent of taking 100 million cars off the road, I was thinking to myself, it was a little bit easier to do it our way than go out and get 100 million Americans to give up their cars. That would have been something that even this group of mayors couldn't have gotten done. Uh, we are pleased to have you as a board member of Bloomberg Philanthropies, and particularly uh, the guy sitting next to you, Phil Levine. Thank you for having us in your great city. Uh, I drove around this morning, and uh, I always look when I go to a new city where the people have a smile on their faces when they're walking down the streets, and I'm happy to say they did. I didn't hear anybody yell, say, say hello to Phil for me, but that's okay. <laughs> and I also wanted to thank o Oklahoma City Mayor Mick Cornett and the outgo as the outgoing president of the Conference of Mayors and New, new Orleans Mayor Mitch Landro, uh, the incoming president, for inviting me. I don't know whether to say condolences or congratulations, but one of the two. You'll do a good job, I'm sure, and uh, Mick certainly did, so you've got a tough act to follow. Um, both these two guys have done incredible jobs for their cities, and Mitch has been a great partner with our foundation on many different issues. Uh, he's never been one to, not to take on tough issues, whether it's education reform or dealing with the uh, complicated issue of Connecticut uh, Confederate monuments. Um, he's always been there. You know where he stands, and he stands up and does what he thinks is right. Uh, when I was elected back in 2001, uh, I remember people telling me, you should never address problems that are politically controversial because it can only hurt your popularity. Well, the truth of the matter is I found the reverse to be true. The more we took on those kinds of issues, the more the voters respected and supported us, even if they didn't agree with us. And that's how a non-Democrat could win three successive elections in a city that is five to one Democratic. And I believe that across this country, voters are looking for leadership and for elected officials who aren't afraid to say what they think and to do what others say can't be done. And the truth of the matter is, mayors do that better than any other group. As we all know, being a mayor is perhaps the toughest job in politics. Like all executive offices, it's a management job, not a policy job. But unlike being a governor or even president, people hold you accountable for what happens in their communities. They expect you to deliver results, and they aren't shy about telling you what you should do or where you should go. You don't get a pass for belonging to a particular party if you're a mayor. Trust me on that. I belong to all the parties, one point or another. And it doesn't matter if you work for a dollar a year like I did. As one of my opponents said during my first campaign, you get what you pay for. <laughs> it didn't help him that much, I might point out. But from my experience, seriously, serving as mayor is the most exciting and rewarding job in the world. Every day, each of you wakes up with a chance to make a real difference in people's lives. And that's a privilege and a responsibility. But all of you know that already. So today, I'd like to talk to you about another aspect of your job that does not get much attention, 
the central role that cities will play in determining our nation's future as a global superpower. Let's start with a basic fact. We're in the middle of a political era defined by partisan paralysis, and nowhere's is it worse than in Washington, D.C. Compared to any other era in modern politics, our nation's capital has been unable to address the great challenges that we all face. The causes are many, gridlock, extremism, partisan media, fear of special interest groups, but the result is the same. On nearly all the big issues, Washington has been AWOL, and as further budget cuts loom, the situation is going to go from bad to worse. But here's the good news. As Washington has grown more dysfunctional, cities have grown more dynamic, and mayors have grown more powerful and important. Pick an issue, any issue, and mayors in both parties are leading where Washington won't. And mayors are working across the aisle in ways that Washington wouldn't dare these days. The result is that, to the extent we're making any progress as a nation, cities are driving it from taking on education reform and pu the public health crisis, to spurring economic development and job growth, to battling crime and climate change. That work has helped revive cities and have made them a magnet for many of the most talented and hardest working Americans. And where currently 50% of the entire population lives, and in a couple decades it will be 70% living in cities. But as cities grow, the longer that Washington endures major challenges, like our crumbling infrastructure and emerging challenges like the automation of jobs, those, that threats, those threats become more dangerous. The question we face is, how do we accelerate cities' progress to make up for Washington's inaction? And I think that the answer lies in all of you. And as the dysfunction in Washington has grown even worse, the need for bold city leadership has grown more urgent. So today, I'm here on behalf of our team at Bloomberg Philanthropies to say we want to help. Now, I know what you may be thinking. Ronald Reagan once said, the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, quote, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, unquote. Having dealt with Washington regulations, I have to say, he actually had a point. Uh, but in all seriousness, I've been in your shoes. I know what it's like to deal with tight budgets and problems that are decades old. I could have used more outside help, and now I'm determined to do what I can to provide it for all of you. You're the ones who are going to have to do all the hard work going forward. The buck stops and will continue to stop with you. But there are things we can do to support you and to help you find and implement new solutions. To do that, today we're launching a major expansion of Bloomberg Philanthropy's work in U.S. cities on all five of the main issues that the foundation focuses on. Government innovation, education, the arts, the environment, and public health. And we are calling our work in U.S. cities the American Cities Initiative. With a budget of $200 million, this is the largest ever philanthropic investment I think has ever been made in helping mayors run their city. Thank you. Now, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Please. Your, your food's getting cold or the dessert's getting warm, one of the two. Um, now, Bloomberg Philanthropies also does a great deal of work internationally, from improving road safety to preventing drowning. And here at home, not all of our work involves cities, but a lot does. Because compared to Washington, American cities are more nimble, more problem, prog programmatic, more responsive to public concerns, more open to experimentation, and about two to three Ameri of Americans live, will live in cities. All of those factors make cities ideal change agents. And by strengthening them, we can strengthen America, no matter which way the winds in Washington may shift. Through the American Cities Initiative, we will invest the $200 million in a wide variety of programs, all of them centered around three primary goals. First, we want to strengthen city halls and equip more mayors to solve their most important problems. We'll do that by providing money, 
by rewarding innovative ideas with prize money. We'll do that by providing technical assistance and by helping more mayors, mayors use data to improve lives. And we'll do all of that by providing in-depth consulting services and leadership development by connecting more mayors to our team of experts. Second, we want to help advance important policies and legislation, particularly with respect to education, climate change, and public health. In some cases, that will take the form of policy support, like the work we're doing to help mayors improve the energy efficiency of their buildings. In other cases, it will take the form of advocacy, including in state capitals, some of which have been defunding cities and eliminating local authority over a variety of issues such as gun violence and clean energy. At a time, yes. At a time when America needs bold city leadership more than ever, we can't afford to let states tie the hands of mayors behind their backs. Our third goal is empowering citizens, including entrepreneurs, artists, and volunteers, to become part of this work. We'll do that through programs that help cities capitalize on volunteers, leverage the power of public art, and form more public-private partnerships. By tapping into the minds and muscles of citizens, their resources and relationships, cities can strengthen communities and create a greater sense of ownership and investment. Across all of this work, we'll convene and connect mayors so that the best practices and most effective policies spread far and wide. Today, we're kicking off this American Cities Initiative by officially opening one part of it, the 2017 Mayor's Challenge. This is the fourth Mayor's Challenge and our biggest. For those who aren't familiar with it, let me quickly explain. The Mayor's Challenge invites cities to propose bold new ideas for tackling problems. We then select the best ideas, help cities refine them, and give the five most promising proposals funding to implement them. In a very successful first competition here in the United States, we took the America's Challenge to London, and after that, we took them, it to Latin America and the Caribbean. And some of our best winners have included things, cities like Providence, Rhode Island, which pioneered a new approach to early childhood education that's helping parents use words with their children, and as experts in the field, very excited. Chicago has created a smart data platform that is anticipating problems, allowing the city to address them before they happen. Warsaw, Poland created a navigation system for the vis visually impaired. Santiago, Chile has just begun attacking their childhood obesity epidemic and Athens, Greece developed a program to enlist citizens in the work of improving their communities. To give you one example of how that's working, the vast majority of graffiti has been removed from most areas of Athens, all done by the public. So these things are useful, and the, one of the criteria is that if you're going to win, it has to be a good idea, good for your city, but it has to be applicable to other cities, and we encourage all cities to take both the winners of the competition and even those who didn't win. And if there was those ideas matter to their cities, use them. Leverage is everything. This year, we're bringing the challenge back home to the US where it belongs and where it began and expanding it because the need for strong city leadership we think has never been greater. Um, here's how it will work. We're inviting every city with at least 30,000 residents to apply. And that includes every city whose mayor is here today. On your table, there is a card. You can look something like this, uh, which you can fill out, and our staff will be collecting responses as you leave. We've already got 100 people turning in their cards, the early birds. Uh, the first 300 cities to register will receive guidance from experts on how to develop breakthrough ideas that could qualify for funding. And after that, we'll invite you to propose your ideas, and we'll look for the ones that have the most potential to address truly pressing needs. And then we'll select 35 of what we're calling champion cities. We'll provide each of them with grants of up to $100,000 to begin testing and refining their ideas. And then next year, we'll award a total of $9 million in prizes to help the five most promising ideas uh, be turned into fruition. Our goal is to jumpstart more great ideas that can help America tackle its tough toughest challenges from the ground up and to spread the ideas that work. And I hope all of you will participate. It's a chance to do something not only for your city, but for the whole nation. 
And don't worry, no idea is too outlandish. Well, actually, some might be. Mayor Levine mentioned the idea of changing the name of Miami Beach to Mayor Levine Beach. That might be a bit much, but that's okay. If you wanted a Bloomberg Beach, we can talk about it, but. Seriously, American Cities, the American Cities Initiative will also offer more opportunities for all of you to participate in a new international leadership training program we're launching next month in partnership with Harvard University. It's called the Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative, and it's tailored to help mayors around the world learn from one another and from experts in both government and business. Now, people all the time ask me, what's the difference between running a business and running a government? And I always tell them that business is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and government, it's exactly the reverse. <laughs> Just have to wait and see how long from when I say it to the laughter. I hate to tell you this, but you've got a B-plus at best. But the truth is, in the private sector, when someone is, hiring as a chief, is hired as a chief executive, he or she is often given, train, given training in leadership development. Unfortunately, mayors who really need the same thing because they have very similar jobs don't get that kind of support, even though they may run often far more complex enterprises. And we're going to start changing that by bringing together some of the best minds in both government and business, along with our own, own network of experts and practitioners. The mayors and their senior teams who participate in the program will receive support throughout the year from world-class experts on management and operations, the program will have a global focus, but because of the urgency of the challenges that I think we have here in America, we decided to reserve more of the program seats for U.S. mayors. In three weeks, we'll bring 30 U.S. mayors to New York City to launch the program. Mayors, uh, are th these mayors are those we've been working with through our existing programs, but next year we'll be open to application process, and I hope many more of you will apply. The American Cities Initiative will also help you raise your profiles so that more Americans hear from mayors rather than just people in Washington. I'm awfully tired of one-sided news. Too often, discussion of national issues focus on, focuses on Washington where very little is happening instead of in city, on cities where big things are taking place. And I don't think that's going to change unless more me, mayors speak up on television and on other national media platforms. So we're going to help you do that through a $600,000 grant, $600, grant to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, which will hire an outside media firm to help put more of you in the news. In the months ahead, we'll roll out another new element of the American Cities Initiative. We'll find new ways to help mayors harness the power of data and public art to improve lives. We're going to form partnerships with mayors who are devoted to combating public health crises like the epidemic cities are facing when it comes to gun violence, obesity, and opioids. Overdoses and guns alone are killing 90,000 Americans a year. We just cannot sit back and accept that. And the responsibility to do something, I think, sits right in this room. It's our responsibility because the other levels of government aren't doing it. But we're the ones that are going to be held responsible, and we're the ones that people are going to appreciate if they really make a difference. We'll also expand our pro bono consulting services to five more cities. Our consulting team is made up of superstars from my administration, and they provide in-depth support to a select number of cities. They work closely with mayors around the globe, and we're excited to have them here doing, doing even more at home. We'll expand our work to empower more mayors to lead the fight against climate change so that America can meet the goals it's set in Paris, no matter what happens in Washington. You should know that over the past few weeks, more than 1,500 businesses in 200 cities around the country, including many represented here today, have signed a pledge to continue doing their part to reduce our carbon emissions by 26% by the year 2025. If you haven't signed up, you can show your support for the Paris Agreement by going to the website wearestillin.org. And mayors of both parties understand that the same steps that protect the planet also bring immediate public health and economic benefits to their cities because people want to live in cities with clean air and where people want to live, businesses want to invest. And I know many of you have been real leaders in this issue, including Mayor Levine. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Carl Pope and I did our best to showcase some of the work in, of your work in our new book, Climate of Hope. Uh, by the way, just in case you're looking for a graduation gift, birthday, graduation, anniversary, 4th of July gift, uh, they're available. Amazon or your local bookstore, if there are any local bookstores left. Today, cities are communicating and collaborating more than ever, and as they do, effective solutions are spreading across the country and around the world. This community of cities, bound together by pragmatism rather than party, is driving progress on the big issues facing our countries. Cities, uh, country. City strengths can serve as a counterweight to Washington's uh, weakness, and together, all of you really can help lead our country forward. And as you return to your cities, I hope you will remember this. So much of America's future, economically, environmentally, socially, lies in your hands. So be bold, aim high, don't let the bastards ever get you down, no matter what they say or what they write. Seriously, people respect those who they think are honest and trying to do what they believe, even if they don't agree with them. And I can tell you, I've had three elections. I'm not going to have another one. But we won all three just by doing exactly that. People kept saying, I don't agree with you on this, but I'm going to vote for you. The nation is counting on you. All the best. Thank you, Mayor Bloomberg. Welcome home. Thank you for that wonderful speech. And, uh, you know, uh, I've always uh, been very interested when a president or somebody in the White House stumbled around, the press would go to Mayor Bloomberg and he would say, where are the adults? <laughs> and he was always very bipartisan about that. So uh, let me just uh, let, let all the uh, mayors here today, if you're interested, be sure to sign the invitation on your table and visit the Bloomberg table outside of the ballroom on your way out to drop in around and take a picture. Of course, today we are here to celebrate the inauguration of New Orleans Mayor Mitch Landrieu. We have a special guest today, a friend. But he's also a friend of ours, and we had two or three days ago Mayor Bill Clinton. And I think those people who really appreciated the Clinton presidency and the Clinton White House and the way he worked for our mayors, if it were not for James Carville, we might never have had Bill Clinton. And I really mean that. So we've asked James to come and talk about where we are right now. But we also ask him to come because he loves Mitch Landrieu, he's his friend, he's a neighbor, and he's from New Orleans, Louisiana. James Carvel, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I, I want to really thank you for scheduling me following a guy that just gave $200 million away. What? You talk about a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, man, if you hope, I, I, Miami, God, I love Miami. And it takes such pride, like New Orleans, and it did, you know, being a coach, it's the gateway to Latin America. And I'm always reminded, when I think of Latin America, I think of former Vice President Dan Quayle, who went down to the Caracas Chamber of Commerce when there was such a thing in Caracas. And he proclaimed that he loved Latin America and he loved the people of Latin America. And his great regret in life was that he never learned to speak Latin. My friend, Mayor Landrieu, uh, you know, Mayor, you know, been in politics for a while. When Mayor Landrieu first got into politics, we both had hair. <laughs> Donald Trump was a Democrat, and the president thought Russia was an evil empire. How things have <laughs> And uh, my wife was supposed to be here, because people always wonder where I kind of famously uh, on opposite sides of the political spectrum. And unfortunately, uh, she's fine, but a tree fell on her foot. <laughs> but she's going to be fine. 
And why is it that Mary and I, who agree on nothing in politics, agree so fervently about Mitch Landrieu? And I'll tell you what it is. During World War II, there was a saying, and there was probably some truth to it, there were no atheists in foxholes. Well, there are no ideologues in City Hall. Every mayor, Republican, Democrat, independent, anything else, is just interested in one thing. What works? How do we get here tomorrow? What are you bringing to me that can help me? And there's no time. There are no, there are no Bernie bros or Tea Party people, anything like that in City Hall. That you, you're in there, and you're dealing with real problems in real time. And when you, I am a, a son of rural America and a citizen of urban America. And I think back, Mayor Andrew, and when I moved to New Orleans in 2008, and it quickly dawned on me that this was a kind of dicey deal here. <laughs> it wasn't going great. And what really, really matters <clears throat> at, the, at the core of everything is leadership. And decisions that politicians, yeah, politicians, decisions that they make have a profound impact on not just everyday life, but everyday life pushing forward. And when I was listening to Mayor, then Mayor Andrew talk as Lieutenant Governor, and he took a particular interest in culture, in the relationship of culture to life. And most people in most cities that you go to, it's a very important distinction, you worry about quality of life. And you say, well, we, we put in and we get a this much for park space and we get this much for days of sunshine and we get this much for libraries and this much for graduation rate and this much for hospital beds and this much for universities and then you total it up. And voila, we all move to Eugene, Oregon <laughs> or someplace because it had more points than somebody else. They won by Pittsburgh beat Cincinnati by two points, so that everybody rejoices. The difference, the difference in New Orleans is we don't speak of a quality of life, we speak of a way of life. And that way of life is drilled in us. And our mayor understands that without a culture and without a big part of our economy being cultural, we have our own music, our own food, our own funerals, our own social structure, our own architecture. And so at the end of the day, what we feel is what are we doing to preserve our way of life? We're not going to give up red beans on Monday for a two degree drop in the humidity. That's just not what we're about. And we had a mayor that understood that, how fragile it was to keep our traditions. You know, one of the things that they work on is when New Orleans music, you don't learn it at the conservatory. It's passed down. And, and things are passed down and it's traditional. And, you know, people say, well, it was nepotism and the Landrews. Well, I'm proud to say that we're the first city to have two father and son combinations as presidents of the United States Conference of Mayors, the Morales and the Landrews. And, you know, it, it, may our members used to say, no one ever said we don't need another Manning playing football, another Marcellus playing music, or another Brennan in the kitchen. So we sort of embrace nepotism in our city. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. You know, it's a good thing. But I, uh, th then what I've learned in uh, being in national politics, and I think I've worked in 22 different countries, when you live in a city, you feel it. You have a relationship. You have a relationship with the streets. You have a relationship with what's going on. You have a relationship with the sewer line, with the water, with the, the, the things get clogged up. You have, you know, we have drainage issues. We have all of that. And as I look back, and you think of things like that is sort of scut work that no one thinks about. How about renegotiating a deal with the firemen, that the firemen have a secure retirement and the city has a secure bond rating. That's hard stuff. 
That's not glamorous. That's not cutting a new ribbon. But that's every day of being a mayor and what our mayor does. And you're right, people at some level don't understand that. And it is about, and as Mayor Bloomberg pointed out, is it, it is about doing difficult things. It's about supporting these schools in New Orleans that have made probably, we're probably the single, single most improved urban school district in the country. And thank you also, Senator Landrieu, for being supportive of that, which wasn't always the easy thing to do in Louisiana if you were a Democrat. That was not the easy call. Very famously and very correctly, we made a, the mayor made a very difficult call that was very necessary. We're, you know, we're 300 years next year. Whatever we are, we're still standing. And we have a long and glorious history. And we can acknowledge it, but we also can choose to accentuate and glorify that which should be glorified about our history. And there is much to glorify, and much in the talents of our people, much in the culture of our people, much in the achievements. So we really want every one of you to come down and help us celebrate this. And it's, you know, the thing that I want is I left Louisiana, and I, my grandmother grew up in New Orleans. And what I really want is that if my children stay in New Orleans or decide to come back as I did in my 60s, that it will be there. And it will be there the way it is. It will be there. They will recognize what the music sounds like, what the food tastes like, the social structure, what a carnival crew is like, and all of these things which are so important. And we had a mayor in the most critical time in our history, and I mean that, the most critical time in our history, who understood our people and our culture and what made us different and was willing to do different and courageous things to secure the future of our city. And so, Mayor, I think it's just a, on behalf of Mary, and I think I'll speak for, no one can speak for every New Orleanian, I'm not going to be that presumptuous, but I think I, I speak for, for every thinking New Orleanian that, <laughs> Let me see. One, two, three. <laughs> and it, just what a, what a terrific job that you have done for our city and how you have put us in the spotlight and the things that you've done to make life so much better for all of us. And this is a fitting testament and tribute to the work that you have done to the values that you have, to the understanding of who we are and what we're about, and doing all of the things that we need to secure a future for our city, which is very fragile environmentally, very fragile in a lot of other ways. But I, I've never felt better about the future in New Orleans than I do now. And when you're 72, it's good to feel good about the future of anything. <laughs> so <laughs> I. Uh, I really thank you, and I'm just delighted to talk to you and see my see, see Manny. Well, thank you for the good, what, what a great scheduling job you did, Tom. So thank you all very much, and let's participate in honor of having you here. Thank you so much, Mayor. Okay, um, what is past is prologue. This follows up on more about. A great, a great man that we, we knew, and if he had lived until May 29th of this year, he would have been as old as his mother, 100 years old. But let's look at this film and think about where we are today and where we got to go from today. Let's look at the video. I'm here in Shaw to discuss with you a problem which is not local but national. 
not northern or southern, eastern or western, but a national problem, a national challenge, a problem and challenge and responsibility and opportunity, which will be before us all in the coming months and indeed in the coming years. And I'm talking about the problem of race relations. What happens in Birmingham or Chicago or Los Angeles or Atlanta depends in large measure upon the leadership of those communities. We will back you up. We will work with you in every way possible. But the mayor of every metropolitan city in every section of America must be aware of the difficult challenges he now faces and will face in the coming months. On your return from this conference, you can set an example in your communities to which the timid can rally and which those clinging to the past cannot ignore. I ask you to join with me as a fellow American, as a responsible citizen, as one who occupies a position of responsibility, as one who must in the final analysis themselves solve these problems, which cannot be solved in Washington, to recognize the rights of all Americans in guiding along constructive channels, in working along constructive ways as a free society must to attain a peaceful revolution, which will not only avoid disaster, but much more importantly, fulfill our highest obligations. Ladies and gentlemen, as we look at our history, we are today experiencing something that has happened five times. Five times. In 1933, 1934, Sims Wamsley was elected president of this organization. Four more times. Ernest Dutch Moriel, Moon Landrieu, Mark Morrell, and now Mitch Landrieu. The history of this city, the presidential history of this city, surpasses any city in the United States of America. We've had, we've had, we've had more presidents from New Orleans than we've had from New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Burnsville, Minnesota, Columbia, South Carolina, Gary, Indiana, and York, Pennsylvania. And so today, we have to look at our history. And I want to say a few things about a, a man I worked for in 75 and 76. His name is Moon Landrieu. 72, James, we were at the Roosevelt Hotel. I never will forget it. The band started playing Dixie. You know, back then, when, we, when Georgia came out on the field, we played Dixie. I'm a dog, you know. He's LSU. This is a religious issue, this <laughs> Southeastern Conference stuff. But seriously, uh, uh, Moon w walked up to the band and said, if you play that, if you play that damn song one more time, you're going to leave. Now, this was in 72. I'm not going to, as, as Mitch has taught us, we all had our way towards race. But I want to show you a clip of a great American. And I've often said, James, that if Moon Landrieu had Hamilton Jordan on his staff, he would have been president instead of Jimmy Carter. That's how, that's how good a politician he was. And I observed uh, this is my 47th or 8th year, and I really believe it. So let's watch this clip of the other Landrieu who was our president, Moon Landrieu. I didn't even know the flag was in the chamber until I got elected 
and took my seat. The year was 1969. Former Mayor Moon Landrieu was 36 years old and an at-large member of the New Orleans City Council, full of social and racial justice theories, coming off six years of serving in the Louisiana House of Representatives, fighting segregation policies. That's when he says he noticed the Confederate flag inside the New Orleans City Council chambers. And I told them I'd like to get the flag out of the chamber. I didn't think it was serving as well. And only Philip Siasio kind of agreed with that. Other five members didn't. Without enough support, the flag stayed, stationed among others at every council meeting, until, says Landrew, Eddie Saper joined the council. The current former judge and legislator was new to politics back then. Like Landrew, he wanted the flag to go. So I said, I've been waiting all my life for you, man. Where have you been? I think both of us were from a younger generation. We didn't see any reason to perpetuate a, a cause that was lost and a cause that was not justified to start with, which was the perpetuation of slavery. Together with some supporting council members, Landrew and Saper had enough votes to remove the flag. On May 16, 1969, Saper filed a motion which reads, the only flag to be permanently stationed in the council chambers of City Hall shall be the flag of the United States. Why, after close to 100 years, are we still arguing about this thing. It's over with. Now let's get on to trying to correct the damage that was done rather than keep inflicting these insults on a minority population. From 1970 to 1978, Mayor Moon Landrieu desegregated city government and public facilities, appointing African Americans to top positions. Decades later, the debate continues in several places over the flag's meaning and message. I think I was absolutely right in what we did, but I didn't certainly do it with any sense of heroics. It was just something that had to be done. Let me, let me just make, uh, thank you, Moon. Let me just um, hit two or three points, if you don't mind, Mayor Andrew. Um, about 18 mayors decided to go to Detroit City in 33 and 34, the Great Depression. And Sims Wamsley was on the plane, went to the Cadillac Hotel, and they said, we gotta go talk to Franklin Della Roosevelt. So this city, <laughs> the city of New Orleans, started us in Detroit City. Then you had a situation in 75 and 76. New York City was going under. The Chancellor of Germany said, you can't let this happen. Mayor Bloomberg, we didn't realize just what a strong budget that was. I mean, you, you, but the budget then was the second largest budget, government budget. And we, we all were doing business in Kansas and a lot of wonderful places. But the city was going bankrupt. And, and Landrew said, Moon Landrew said, we must meet. And the mayor of Denver said, and the mayor of Anchorage, Alaska said, we're in a tenement house. And if New York City goes bankrupt, we burn. I'm on the fourth floor, they own the first floor. So again, New Orleans was there to save New York City. You go right on down to President Reagan's budget. Ernest Dutch Morial called me. He said, let's come to Washington. We brought hundreds and hundreds of people arguing, arguing for a fair budget because uh, the Reagan administration wanted to abolish everything that we had for cities. They wanted an army and a navy and a Marine Corps. And he fought that battle. Then, in 2001, Mark Marrell became my president. We were sitting in the Occidental Hotel with David Broda. It was his birthday. It was the, and the screen came up on 9-11. And, 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 and Mark was my president. And we immediately called for a federalization 
of the securities of the Alport. And, and we know, and Mayor Bloomberg knows we were there with you to recover. We took the winter meeting to New York City. Now, where, we are, where are we right now? Every, every organization, every faith-based organization, every nonprofit organization, they're looking to the mayors of the United States. They're looking to the mayors of the United States to get us through the political turmoil we're now in. So glad that Mayor Bloomberg is here. He's right, Manny, you're right. He's our world mayor. But let me tell you something. We have a leader coming up that's going to really be there for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, the 75th president of the United States Conference of Mayors, Mitch Landrieu. Thank you all. You, <laughs> what do you say in a conference that has been blessed with so many different wonderful leaders that have said so much? I will try. The first thing that comes to my mind is what would have happened had Jack Kennedy and Martin and Robert not been taken from us too early. That is a thought worth contemplating. And so I suppose the best place for me to begin uh, is with thanks. I'm thankful to God for his blessings and for his mercy. I'm thankful to uh, James who came today and Mary uh, and of course, even though she couldn't make it, they are a personification that bipartisanship is alive and well in America. I'm particularly thankful to my friend and my mentor, uh, Michael Bloomberg, who just demonstrated to us again today how incredible uh, an impact one human being can have. You know, Michael, I've often said that uh, a person cannot be great if they're not good, and my friend, you are both. And I want to thank you for the commitment that you've made to the people of America. <laughs> to Mayor Levine and to your entire team, uh, unbelievable. Mayor Diaz, thank you for help laying the groundwork. Uh, your team did an incredible job making this such a huge success, and we really appreciate it. Uh, to Mayor Cornette, Mick, you and Terry, uh, you guys have been unbelievable. You have led us through a very a difficult year, and we are going to miss you, uh, and we thank you for that. To Tom and to all of his staff, these guys work year in and year out to make us all look good, uh, and I want to thank you to make this, for making this organization so strong. Uh, to Mayor Benjamin and Mayor Burnett, I look forward to your leadership. It will be a partnership that I hope uh, will last for a very, very long time. To all of my fellow mayors that were able to stay with us, and that has uh, become uh, the mayors that are making America great again. I really think that uh, you're doing an incredible job, and I look forward to your leadership, and I thank you for serving uh, all of us in the years to come. To all of my staff, everybody knows us. We're, we're only as good as the people uh, that are assisting us, and many of them are here today. You guys, I love you, and I thank you. And, of course, I wouldn't do this without the people of New Orleans, who have been uh, just tremendous in giving me the ability to do the work that I do not only back home, but now as the President of the United States Conference of Mayors. And then finally, I'd like to just take a minute before I get into the gravamen of my talks to uh, thank my family. My beautiful wife, Cheryl, is here with us today. Uh, Cheryl is a practicing lawyer. She has been working every day of our life while together we have had five uh, beautiful children. Gracie is with us today and my youngest son, William. We left three of our kids home, uh, but I'm sure they're safe and I hope they're doing well. And I am a, I'm also joined today by my mother and my father uh, and three of my sisters and brothers. My father and my mother uh, were both born and raised in New Orleans. Uh, my dad graduated from law school in 1954. My mother was studying to be uh, a nun. And God had other plans for her and him. They were married and immediately went to the Pentagon uh, where my father was serving in the JAG Corps. In the shadow of the Pentagon, my oldest sister, Mary, who 
is here with us today, was born. And over the next 11 years, my mother and my father had nine children. Uh, between us, we have 38 uh, nieces and nephews. My mother, my mother still looks like she's 29 years old. Uh, they raised us in a neighborhood called Broadmoor on the corner of Priya Street and General Pershing. Ward 12, Precinct 18. That got seared into our minds really early. Uh, but we lived on a wonderful street. We played in the street. Our yard was open to all of our neighbors. We were in the first integrated neighborhood in the city. I can remember very well on Sunday nights in front of the TV watching Bonanza, watching the wonderful world of Disney. Am I dating anybody in here? You remember that, right? Uh, it, was a, it was a great life. Uh, but my mother and father uh, taught us to reach out to other people, to help other folks. Uh, they subsequently raised their children. One of them was one of the youngest women ever to serve in the legislature. She served as state treasurer for eight years. She served as a United States senator for 16. My sister Mary Landrieu is here today. with her husband, Frank, who was a parish president of Washita Parish. Uh, my sister, Madeline, is here, who served as a judge on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal, and next week will take over and become the new dean of Loyola Law School, who is with us today. My baby brother, the youngest of nine, who is the senior prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office for street gang and violent crime, uh, is with us today with his wife, Carrie. Uh, Maurice, thank you for being with us. We're actually the slackers in the family. The other, the other five are home, you know, taking care of all of our children and our business. So I love you all, and I thank you all very much. I would not be here without you. I can't tell you how proud and honored I am to stand before you today as president of this prestigious and important organization. And I am here to say that America's greatness is alive and well in cities and towns across this country from urban to rural to suburban and from coast to coast. It is in our cities where Americans work. It is in our cities where Americans play, where it's Little League or the pros, at a museum, in a park, shopping or on Main Street. It's in our cities where we pray, in churches, in synagogues, in mosques, side by side, and in peace. It's in our cities where energy meets opportunity, where grit and determination produce incredible results, new jobs, innovation, entrepreneurship. It's in our cities where values like faith, family, and country still ring true today. And it is in our cities where hope hits the street. As the government closest to the ground, mayors are leading the way in issues both big and small. I don't have to tell you this. You've shown me. You've shown us. Mayor Levine did a great job highlighting how each of you is setting examples for our country. You're setting examples on how to rebuild American infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, transit, water systems. You're combating climate change in every corner and in every community in this country. You're connecting people to jobs and opportunity through education and training. Cities are also focused every day on making our country safe. And if you want to find a bipartisan, bicoastal pathway forward on immigration or health care, look no further than this very room itself. We can show America what leadership really looks like. This country is clearly hungry for results. And that is what a mayor delivers every day. We govern in real time. We govern in reality. We never step back when duty calls. We don't just talk about it. We just don't debate it because we don't have time for that. So while the cable news channels may train America's eyes on Washington, I want to tell our story. I want America to see what mayors have to offer. This is why earlier in this conference, we began to lay out a positive, bipartisan, national vision for our mayor's future, an agenda for America, our plan for action. And I come before you eager to share our plan of action with America, to show Washington what kind of partner we hope for in them, and excited about opportunities for mayors to define a better future for the people of this country. 
a future that secures families in every community, a future that rebuilds our most dangerous and crumbling infrastructure, a future that creates a stronger, more inclusive economy, a future that invests in fair, equitable, and healthy communities, a future that honors diversity, brings people together, and restores faith in public service for those who have been left behind for too long. In essence, this is about security. It's about jobs. It's about opportunities for America's families. This is about restoring the dignity and reputation that America has locally and globally. This is about improving the lives of all Americans. This is about making sure that we don't leave anybody behind because here is the hard truth and the eloquent beauty of our country. You see, none of us will truly live up to our full God-given potential unless all of us have the same opportunity. <laughs> mayor, as I enter my final year of my second term as mayor and my 30th year of public service, I still cherish the opportunity to seek solutions and to find consensus. Hear me now. Compromise is not a dirty word. That is why I know our plan for action is right for America's future right now. But beyond the words on paper, our job is to deliver for our people. It's to put a face with the public policy that we create. This week, the Senate is likely to take up a vote on a bad health care bill that will only cause more confusion and anxiety in the people and for the people of this country. In my opinion, it will make us sicker and it will hurt the economy. It is a basic fundamental reality that less coverage means more burden on our cities, on our hospitals, in our ERs, and in our emergency response. And if Washington will just slow down, we, the mayors of America, can help get beyond Democrat and Republican politics and find the fixes necessary to protect over 20 million people who may lose health care if they keep going in the direction they're going today. We all believe here that that's a better way. So let's be honest, in these moments of uncertain, chaotic, and sometimes frustrating times, the families that we represent cannot look to Washington for answers. In this political climate, we as mayors must fight to occupy the radical center where idealism meets reality and where we put people over politics. And so we need to speak with one voice, with courage, with conviction, with honesty. And if we do, America will follow. When we work across party, it's good for our people. When we find common ground, we find neighbors who share the dream of a better future that we are all working for. We cannot simply resist and retreat. We must lead and we must engage. Now, whether we like it or not, we are bound together, sharing one destiny, one fate. You've heard it before, e pluribus unum. Out of many, we are one. Mayors, we know that America is not and has never been a survival of the fittest, zero-sum game, I win, you lose nation. That is not when we are at our best, but that is where we are now. Our founders declared that it is we the people, that we are indivisible with liberty and justice for all, not just for some, and that is the true genius of America. If you have faith in God, if you believe in our country, then you already believe that there is something bigger than ourselves and our own selfish interest. This is what Dr. King summons us to when he said we are all tied together in a single garment of destiny. But when that garment gets ripped, it's up to us as the mayors. We are the ones that have to stitch it back together, one stitch at a time. If we are united, if we are indivisible, then we are strong. As President Clinton told us, this is about addition and subtracting, not subtraction, about multiplication, not division. 
And so this is where I want us to start. Too often we can be paralyzed by division, we can be overcome by indifference. In our country, there have always been demagogues with their own political agendas that will seek to divide us. They will try to pit people one against another, black against white, against Latino, gay versus straight, Republican, Democrat, rural, urban, north versus south. You've heard it many, many times before. As opposed to encouraging standing side by side, we too often fight over a little bit of meat on an otherwise empty bone. This is not the future that we want for our people. We know that if we are going to create opportunity, we have to be united as one. And if we can come together across race, across class, across geography, it would be a political tidal wave. We would be an unstoppable force in America, and our country would be better for it. Now, Mayors, I want you to stop for a minute and think about why we are here and who we are here to serve. Think about those who we have lost due to the attitudes of exclusion and divisiveness. Consider how much potential is denied because we remain isolated in our comfortable corners, afraid to extend a hand because of fear or indifference. How many more must be forsaken because we are not helping each other? How many more African-American kids have to be killed because our society does not value young black men? How many more parents have to lose their child to addiction or mental health illness because politics prevents us from finding funding solutions? How many more times will the relationship between the police and the community be strained because we judge both by an appearance and a uniform rather than by behavior? Mayors, this is why we must lead with courage. We must lead with conviction. We must lead with honesty. We must sow the seeds and till the soil if we expect to reap the fruits of our labor. We must match American exceptionalism with extraordinary deed. We can see that the country's solutions to this country's problems will not come from the halls of Congress, nor the boardrooms on Wall Street, but instead they will emerge from the main streets and byways of this great country. This is our wheelhouse. This is our playing field, and we will step up to the plate. You see, as Tom said, we are the inheritors of a great legacy, and with that comes great responsibility. We, in fact, stand on the shoulders of giants. Indeed, I am lucky enough to be the fifth mayor of New Orleans to serve as president of this incredible organization and the second one named Landrew. As a young boy, I watched my father help integrate our great American city. It was his strength, his resolve, his clarity of vision, and his relentless focus on the people he served that inspires me still to this day. Daddy, I love you. It was Dutch Morial who became my first African-American man, then his son Mark H. Morial after that, who today is the president of the National Urban League. All three of these men led this organization and continue to set a great example. At every defining moment in our country, it has been mayors stepping into the breach to help American families. Mayor de Blasio the other day reminded us that in 1932, mayors were convened by Detroit Mayor Frank Murphy and later New York Mayor LaGuardia to respond to the Great Depression and to deliver aid to cities in partnership with Washington. Mayors like Andrew Young, Maynard Jackson in Atlanta, George Moscone, Diane Feinstein, Willie Brown in San Francisco, Jerome Cavanaugh in Detroit, and so many more across this country led the fight for civil rights and equality. You heard a minute ago that in the 70s when my dad was president of this organization, this organization along with Mayor John Lindsay and Abe Beam convinced President Gerald Ford to help save a great American city from bankruptcy, and today New York sits as our north shining star for the entire nation. <laughs> After September 11th, Mayor Morial led this conference, and with Mayor Bloomberg turned New York around, D.C. responded, helped spur investments in homeland security that all of us share and benefit today. In New Orleans, Tom 
Cochran and Long Beach Mayor Beverly O'Neill worked out of my Lieutenant Governor's office to help us recover after Katrina. And Mayor Couch came down with mayors from across the country after the BP oil spill. Mayors have led this nation forward for generations. This mayors is the legacy that we inherit and the responsibility that we know we now own. And today, we stand at another moment. We have to rise to the occasion that we find ourselves in. Together, we can reteach America a lesson that we all learned before, that everybody is the same, that everyone ought to be given the same opportunity and be expected to share the same responsibilities. We all have value in faith, in family, and country. We all want our kids to have a better life than we have had. The things that which unite us in our shared humanity make us stronger than anything that divides us. We cannot stay quiet when there's an injustice. Even if it's being perpetrated by people with great power, might does not make right. That is why we as a conference will speak with courage. We will speak with conviction. We will speak with honesty. Mayors, you have to use your powerful voices. Bring your leaders from Washington to the streets of America and carry the voices of your people to Washington with us. Show them how it's done without acrimony to better people's lives. We can do it. We must. Mayors, I have seen people come together in some of our highest and lowest moments. I have stood on the flooded streets of New Orleans after the federal levees broke following Hurricane Katrina, and I can attest to this truth. I saw it with my own eyes. When everybody is wet, when everybody needs to be saved, and everybody needs to be pulled out of the water, nobody worries about what boat they're going to get in. They just get in the damn boat. I saw in that moment of catastrophe when the entire civil government of the United States disappeared that African Americans and whites did not see color in that moment. When they had a common enemy, when they had a common threat, when they had a common opportunity, there was complete and total unity. I saw the whole world and all of you rally to our side to save a great American city and the soul of this nation. And despite the many, many challenges that New Orleans still has, my city, the city that I love unconditionally, is alive, it's well, and it is booming today. My friends, we should not wait until the next catastrophe to bring our country together. We have to do it now. We can and we must. We have a special obligation to the people of America. And as President Kennedy told us directly to the mayors in 1963, you can set an example in your communities to which the timid can rally and which those clinging to the past cannot ignore. I know we have a lot of work to do. Our feet may be tired, but our soul is strong. Many of you have praised the speech that I gave about the Confederate monuments. I am very thankful for that. I don't deserve it, but I do appreciate it. But this is the one thing that was seared in my mind after being here this week. In a time of great turmoil, a mayor talked, and the nation listened. You can do the same. If you hear nothing other than this, take this home. Mayors, do not be afraid. When you speak, people will listen. When you act, people will join you. When you lead, people will follow. Mayors, this is our time to lead, and we will do it. When we speak with one voice, we break through the noise and the chaos. We calm the waters of our nation. When we speak with courage, we can be the voice of the American people. When we speak with clarity and honesty, we can make these times less uncertain and less chaotic. Our cities and our nation will be better for it. 
We will prove that we are a force to be reckoned with on behalf of the American people. Now, I will end where I began, with my parents, my mom and my dad. They taught all nine of their kids to love one another, to be just, to be fair, to be honest. They taught us to work hard and play hard, to be thankful, and to help others. These are good rules for life. And it turns out that they're good rules for governing as well. If my father were up here right now, he would tell me and you, you have political capital for a reason. Mayor Bloomberg said it earlier, use it. What else is it for? In these times, let's be bold because it is our time. Mayors, out of many, we are one. And when we are one, we are strong. Now, in what is clearly a moment of truth for our nation, we are called on once again to, pro to prove that this country can live up to the ideals set forth by our founding fathers. We are being called to duty, and we have to respond. Mayors, it is our time. Let's seize the moment, and let's get back to work. Thank you, and God bless you all. Okay, we'll fix to close this baby down but before we close it. Unfortunately, I have to highlight the rest of the day's events. <laughs> One of the things I want to do is I want to bring the Landrieu family up here for a photo. Let me mention that. So y'all go to the restroom. We'll be here when you get back. Uh, from 2.30 to 3.15, there's a host city workshop called our 5G Future with CEO of Sprint. This session will be informative and helpful, discussing the 5G networks, encouraging innovation in cities. The session will also discuss the One Million Project, which seeks to bridge the digital divide among U.S. students. Thank you to Miami Beach for organizing this great workshop. With that, I'd like to say that we will adjourn the 85th annual meeting of the United States Conference of Mayors. We look forward to seeing all of you. The leadership of this organization will be in August in New Orleans. And from then, we will be as strong as ever with the great leadership of Mayor Mitch Landrieu as our president. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you, Mayor Levine. So let's get, let's get the family up here. Thank you, sir. Mr. Worldwide to infinity, <laughs> you know the roof on fire. We go boogie, hoogie, hoogie, jiggle, wiggle, and dance, <laughs> like the roof on fire. We go drink drinks and take shots until we fall out, like the roof on fire. Now, baby, get my booty naked, take off all your clothes and light the roof on fire. Tell them, tell them, baby, 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 baby.